a returning guest, uh, a Taiwanese communist rapper, Xiang Yu, who had been banned on Twitter for his political post. So we are having him back to continue our series on the political history of Taiwan. Uh, particularly on this episode, we like to focus on uh, the Cold War era post uh, post 1950s, especially under the Taiwan under Jiang Jingguo, uh, son of Jiang Kai She. Uh, so welcome back, uh, Xiang Yu. Hello, good to be back. Uh, how are you, man? It's what you've been up to since uh, last time we talked? Oh, it's been such a long time. I've been I'm getting more hours at work, and um, yeah, just doing that and reading quite a bit, putting this off. <laughs> it's okay. Well, I'm glad we finally got you back. Um, we actually got, have a lot of positive feedback uh, on our our present series uh, up to you know nineteen late nineteen fifties um, yes. because there's a lot of ignorance. Frankly, there's a lot of ignorance and just lack of knowledge about Taiwan and the historical background on Taiwan. Um, not just in the West, I would say even in uh, in the mainland. Uh, on the mainland. So it's, that's why I think it's very helpful f- to have someone like you with with the Taiwanese background to, to come to talk about Taiwan and give us a perspective on the political development, you know, since the Cold War. So whenever you're ready to start, man. Yeah, I must also say that um, a lot of this is also um, areas of confusion even in Taiwan because of, um, as you can see from... Um, our series so far, there's been so many different forces at play, people, um, different groups, different factions within the population with different interests. So yes. um, with, you know, social engineering and stuff like that, a lot of these truths are also um, distorted. And I mean, I do have my biases, but I'm doing my best to just kind of lay the facts out there for everyone so then they can judge, they can like kind of reach their own um they can form an educated opinion and also know where to start um, investigating from here. I'm just laying down the like the basis. Yes. I'm not really trying to tell anyone to, um, you know, um, hold certain views or whatever. But I mean, if you're if you're a listener, you can probably um, kind of guess where my views are. I mean, Carl already said that I am a I am a communist. So <laughs> sorry, um, sorry to expose you. Um, I, I mean, we. Um... Some of the thing that uh, you know we will talk about later about you know the kind of rewriting of Taiwanese history, especially post nineties. There was a lot of that. Yes. But for now, let's focus on uh, you know I believe last time what we stopped was we stopped after the second Taiwan Strait crisis uh, when there was uh, you know exchange of artillery duel basically between the the mainland the Chinese mainland and also the the Taiwan held offshore island. Oh, I should really say Jiang Kai-shek held the uh, offshore island of Kinmen and uh, and Mazu, right? So so let's pick up where we left off. So, so that we're going to transition into uh, basically 1960s when Jiang Kai-shek himself will starting to kind of uh, remove be more removed from the scene, and his son, uh, Jiang Jingguo, will come to take an uh, ever large role in Taiwan. You like to start? Yeah, well, actually, I would say that he was still like at the forefront because um, Jiang Jingguo didn't replace him until the 70s, but um, Jiang Jingguo mm-hmm. was doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes. I mean, he was the head of the secret police, and he oversaw the 10 major constructions in the early 70s. So I think um, now, now that um, I've provided the context of, you know, the retrocession, as in like Taiwan's return to China in 1945, and then the, um, the KMT's retreat to Taiwan in 1949, and all of the um, contradictions that have played out through this time, mm-hmm. and also um, Taiwan's position in the, like... In the U, not in the U. You know what I mean? Like its relationship with the U.S. and it's like its triangular mm-hmm. relationship with the, with mm-hmm. the um, Communist Party of China. I think now is a good time to talk about um, the kind of the 
the beginnings of the um, independence movement. Because um, mm-hmm. I think um, I've mentioned in earlier episodes that basically communism was wiped out in Taiwan through Chiang Kai-shek's uh, white terror, correct? Yes, yes. We have covered the 228 incident on Taiwan and its aftermath and the starting of the white terror. And and yes, the, 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 the Taiwanese communist movement was basically crippled after that. Yes. And then um, we've also talked about how um, basically there was this sort of tension between the new arrivals from the mainland and the existing um, population in Taiwan. Yes. And and also how um, among the existing population in Taiwan, kind of the um, the existing ruling class, like the um, the landed aristocracy, was kind of bought off by the KMT, and then through um, these um, rubber stamp unions, the working class was also kind of bought off, and then there wasn't really much of a middle class in Taiwan at first. So then, um, kind of the it was kind of a, an area where the KMT didn't have too much of a stronghold in its um, ideological influence. Yeah, so that's oh, going to be, I mean, one one important thing to keep in mind for our audience is that KMT um, was an outsider force to Taiwan, and its support initially derived not from. Um, local populace, but really was derived from its military force. It's because, you know, KMT has a large military, which was previously financed by United States. And just through its, uh, its, its, the, the muscle of its military, you know, KMT were able to impose its rule in Taiwan. So in many ways, it does not, um, it's not beholden to any invested interest in Taiwan itself. That's one of the reasons yeah. it, it, it's able to push forward the land reform, right? I mean, that, that's something that KMT would never be able to do on mainland China because, you know, its, it's main backer and the main source of political support on mainland China was a landlord class. So, so they could never have done something like land reform in China. But... Ironically, once they're in Taiwan, they were able to do something like that. Yeah, and the landed aristocracy in Taiwan was never exactly the ruling class because in because in the past, from ni- from 1895 to 1945, they were pretty much kind of the um, the go to for Japanese people. They were like kind of um, intermediaries, you know, to kind of control the population in Taiwan. So they've kind of they kind of ended up adopting a similar role under the KMT. Yes, and yes. then. Um, so- after after with with Taiwan's industrialization and its um, economic growth, there is like a burgeoning um, petty bourgeois class of, you know, like white collar workers, um, professionals, lawyers and stuff. And they'll play a key role in the um, Taiwan independence movement, which yes. um, really was not necessarily a, a separatist movement all along. It just kind of became a two-in-one package with the, right. the, I mean, with the bourgeois democratization movement. I mean, initially, it mostly grew out of opposition to the KMT dictatorial rule, right? Yes, I mean, like, yes. Because that, that's something that most people could agree with in, in Taiwan. Um, and, you know, it was, it's obvious to anyone that, you know, Chiang Kai-shek was running a dicta- military dictatorship on Taiwan. And... You know, ironically, because Chiang Kai-shek insisted, you know, the one China policy that he is a so legitimate ruler of China. One way they, uh, you know, those bourgeoisie intellectuals find uh, to attack KMT and Chiang Kai-shek is, uh, you know, is through Taiwan independence. It's like, okay, we, we, we actually, if we can claim that Taiwan has nothing to do with China, then that deprives uh, legitimacy, you know, from the Chiang Kai-shek regime. That, that's one of the angle of attack, right? Yes, he's, um, what people don't get is Chiang Kai-shek was vehemently for one China, though it was a losing battle from his perspective. And um, although he was vehemently against independence, he did set the stage up. And that's where I'm going to get into right now. 
I'm going to start with um, but start by introducing a figure named um, Peng Mingmin. You've heard of him? Yes. Okay. Yes. Go on. Right. So um, that way you can fill me in if I get lost. Basically, he was for a while um, in the early times, ever since like the '60s, he was the biggest target among the independence movement by the KMT. And he was a um, political science professor at National Taiwan University, which is Taiwan's most prestigious university. And um, he was actually kind of close to the um, to the like the um, the ruling clique for a while. Like he was handpicked by um, Chiang Kai Shek to serve as the advisor of the so-called um, ROC's delegation to the UN. Hmm. Yeah. And then. Um, I guess um, I'm just going to skip forward. He was kind of exiled for a while, and then he returned to Taiwan in 1992 after Li Denghui, who became the, the leader after um, Jiang Jingguo, ended um, blacklists and then granted amnesty to political prisoners. And then mm-hmm. um, Peng Mimin ran for um, the so-called um, president or leader of the Taiwan area as the um, DPP candidate in 1996, but he lost mm-hmm. to Li Denghui. And then in 2000, he became um, a senior advisor of um, Chen Shui-bian, who was elected leader in um, 2000. So, on uh, anyways, we're going to go back now to 1964. Mm-hmm. So, September 20th, 1964, Peng Mingmin with two of his students, Xie Chongmin and uh, Wei Tingchao, wrote... The, um, the Manifesto of the Taiwanese People's Self-Salvation, or in Chinese, Taiwan Ren Min Zi Zhou Xuan Yan. And they were arrested before it was published. So um, I guess you can see that the secret police in Taiwan were... They knew their shit. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just going to cover the main points and the... Um, well, main points to me. I, I kind of just went through the, um, the document. Mm-hmm. And um, it's and you can see from these things that um, Taiwan independence isn't really mentioned. is It's not really the focus of this manifesto. Much of the manifesto is opposition to the KMT's dictatorial rule. So he says, oh, they say, um, the three of them, the 12 million Taiwanese people are not willing to submit themselves to communist rule, nor do they wish to be destroyed by Chiang Kai-shek. So we kind of see a um, a shift from earlier, you know, anti-KMT forces, like around the two in the ni- 1940s and the early 1950s. A lot of them were like, okay, we're a part of China, but we don't like blue China. We want red China, right? But then, um, as as you can see from the last two episodes, the Korean War kind of changed the situation, and it, reunification under the communists did not seem too um, feasible or likely, at least during that time, during that era. So, this uh, manifesto called for the overthrow of the illegitimate Chiang regime and the establishment of a free and democratic Taiwanese republic. And then the manifesto goes on to claim that the whole world has recognized one China and one Taiwan as a fact. Now, as you can see from the last episodes, um, this kind of is a little bit of an exaggeration. It was kind of it was it was kind of a Western conspiracy to turn it into a fact. Anyways, but um, but I mean, um, the world did recognize that the two sides of the street were separately administered. And then the manifesto goes on to mention that the U.S. recognized the so-called ROC as the legitimate Chinese government at the time because it wanted a bargaining chip with its negotiations with the communists, which I guess it's kind of true. He, um, it mentions that the Seventh Fleet is the Chang regime's life support. And as we can see from um, the last episode when we talked about the Korean War, that is also true. Yes. Um, which is um, like reclaim the mainland as a slogan exists for Chiang Kai-shek to maintain his rule, but it's not something that he will achieve. And history has proven that to be correct. Um, And I also want to add that that slogan um, that we will reclaim the mainland was pretty much used to appease the um, mainland military families in Taiwan who missed their homes and want to go back. 
basically the main support for the KMT rule in Taiwan. So yeah, have- you piss off all the soldiers, you're kind of screwed. Yep. And um, he also mentions that Chiang Kai-shek's army is at most a defensive army that is incapable of carrying out an attack, and it depends on U.S. military aid. And um, at that time, it actually was military aid. It's not like the um, the government today, which s- spends like ungodly amounts of money on U.S. equipment. Back then, Chiang Kai-shek didn't pay for shit. That was like it's one thing that we can um, that's commendable. And yeah. um, the um, manifesto says that U.S. involvement means um, maintaining the U.S. line of defense in the Pacific. So we can see that on um, like the early independence people, like they were kind of more aware of geopolitics and the role of the U.S. Whereas nowadays, you see a lot of them. Um, you see the separatists today; they want to just make believe that the U.S. is an ally, when really it's kind of they're 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 there when um, interests overlap. Yes. Yeah. So then um, next point is the so-called National Assembly, the legislators and members of the control yuan. So basically the um, the control yuan and the the um, legislative yuan and um, the National Assembly will make up the parliament. But then the National Assembly eventually got um, got abolished in the um, I think the early 90s. Anyways. He mentions it that was these play a facade of democracy, right? Which is totally ridiculous because the legislative yuan is supposedly composed of a uh, representative from from all different provinces of China, right? And and those people, the so-called elected members, who were uh, you know <clears throat> were got their position from the so-called 1946 it's 1946 47. or 1947 election and then then they there have been no subsequent election <laughs> so yeah. they became like set for life and then then they're and then know, they were appointed and they were to be replaced exactly and then the you know the 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 all the places they they supposedly represent you know they most of them are now in prc in you know under the communist party control <laughs> and and yeah. and you know and the, so so it's it's this kind of weird rubber stamp a uh, 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 government structure that everybody know is kind of sham you know south korea does the same thing still today they they oh, have no. um yeah they have um <laughs> They have um like um governors for all of the provinces in the north. Wow, I wonder what they do for a living. Like, do they just like sit there in their offices and just like kind of study the province? I don't know. Anyways, um, the the manifesto mentions that this was only democratically elected on a technicality, and like yes. like Carl said, they were elected in 1947 when the government was still based in mainland China. But even then, the um, so called ROC government was not popular on the mainland. Nope. And then he goes on to mention that of the 3,000 some members of the National Assembly, less than 20 are Taiwanese. So think about it 3,000 and less than 20 of them are Taiwanese. Taiwanese, as in like people whose families were already in Taiwan prior to 1945. Yeah. Whether they be, you know, like, um, like Minan or Hakka or. But, but, but then like there were no, like no indigenous. Like people no. in government, so you can kind of see how these people, when they talk about Taiwanese, it's kind of th- there is a tendency of erasing the Aboriginal people. Of course, yeah. And then um, he also goes on to mention that of the four hundred seventy three four hundred seventy three legislators of the Legislative Yuan, only six are Taiwanese. So you can see that a lot of this is based on identity politics and the feeling of um, not being represented by the government that's ruling Taiwan. Yeah. And, I um, mean, some, many of their complaints were legitimate, right? I mean, I mean yeah. KMT was kind of an outsider force <laughs> ruling through military dictatorship propped by U.S. All that is true, right? 
Uh, yeah, but, and then like it's the way it handled these contradictions r- really did nothing but piss people off. I mean, like, how would you feel? I mean, you're from Chongqing. How would you feel if they like and you spoke your dialect at school as a kid, like yeah. outside the classroom? Yeah. Like, how would you feel if you were told, "Hey, if you speak your own dialect at school, um, and you get caught, you get fined money." Yeah, or get beaten. I mean, that's that's. I I was shocked, but you know, when yeah, I find out about the corporal punishment in 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 Taiwan schools, uh, like during. The Zhang Kaixie and Zhang Jingguo era. I think it still kind of existed when I was a little kid. Like it was just being phased out in like the nineties. Because mm. um, when I was like five, and um, I was like moving on from kindergarten to first grade, um, I, I was I was in Taiwan for the summer, and my cousin, who was also my age, she's like half a year younger than me, and she was also going to first grade, and she was talking about how um, we need to be on our best behavior because once we are in first grade, we could get our asses kicked if we piss off the teacher. Yeah, that's that's crazy. I mean, like it, it, when I went to school in China in 1980s, you know, we, we the kind of punishment, the worst kind of punishment we will get is, you know, go stand against the wall. <laughs> oh, that happened to me a lot, like in, in the U.S. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I, and I did a lot of shit when I was in when I was in uh, grade school. But anyway, go on. Yeah. And um, so then. The manifesto goes on to say that the Chiang Kai-shek clique is not representative of mainland China, nor can it represent Taiwan. And this is also an accurate statement. It mentions that in, the 1950, in, in 1950, the KMT carried out land reform, which is a process that overthrew Taiwan's traditional ruling class. So, like I said earlier, That's... this comment gives away the petty bourgeois class stance of Peng Mingmin and like the the broader um the intellectuals who were behind the um independence movement and the democratization it was a petty bourgeois like i very idealistic version of democracy that's divorced from class society mm-hmm. and then he I goes mean, like to think the, sorry i'm sorry to interject but the 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 landed gentry in taiwan um as you mentioned earlier functioning earlier just as a tool for Authority to impose their, their rule on, on you know at the local grassroots level. That, I mean that that was a case uh, throughout most of the kind of the imperial dy- dynastic China, right? That's how the the traditional uh, governance was being enforced through the local gentry. But the local gentry themselves are not really ruling class per se. Yeah, they they're, answered they're to somebody. More... They were given privileges. Exactly, exactly. They're they're a privileged class, but. You know, like the 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 ruling class before would be you know the 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 the, the, the official the officials right or, or from the bureaucracy yeah. and and then you know they they are that's why all the landed gentry try to send their sons to you know pass the civil service exam trying to get inside the the the, the imperial bureaucracy. I mean, it, it, when when Japan took over Taiwan, he kind of kept that structure. Uh, intact at some level. It's yeah, still... it was a colony, so they were studying how to rule Chinese people, basically. Yep, yep. So, so it's it's inaccurate to say that the the, the landed gentry were some some somewhat somewhat ruling class. They were not. They were ruling class aligned. Yes, yes. They, they were like the local ruling class. It's kind of like yes. when you have a gang controlling an area, and like the cops, even like the cops know that hey, if we want to deal with this area, we have to go through the. We have to go through the Godfather first. Yep. yep. Similar situation. So then um, now it says that um, the, it talks about land reform and then it talks about how this process overthrew um, Taiwan's traditional like elite. So he kind of does the thing where he sees all peasants as one, ignoring um, classes among peasants. Like, you know, he had like the kulaks, the middle peasants, the poor peasants, etc. It's kind of like um, when... When Stalin carried out um, decolonization in the countryside in the Soviet Union, Westerners were like, "Oh, he was oppressing peasants," like as a blanket statement. When okay, yeah, there's a certain type of peasants were being, you know, were being oppressed and uh, disenfranchised. But, but then, well, it, I mean, that's uh, not even, to the benefit of other peasants. That's not, but that's not even true in Taiwan because the because the, the Taiwan. Um, land reform, you know, well, was I, I know, I know, I know, I know. But what I'm saying is, um, I'm saying the common thing is how they're ignoring the class contradictions among yes. the peasants. Yeah, it's a different I'm just situation. Out yeah. For our audience, that that in Taiwan, the the 
the land reform carried out was in form of you know the the the, the government, the KMT government buying out the landlords basically you know like here here's here's some money we'll, and then we'll, we'll buy out your land at this price and then you know we we allow us to you know redistribute your land etc cetera, et cetera. so so yeah. so like it was, it was also it, paid in um stocks to um um to um government owned enterprises so if you see yeah. like some people like like middle class people in taiwan who like for some reason like inherit stocks from like their deceased grandparents and they all happen to be um to be um, government-owned enterprises, or I, some a lot of these were privatized. But then, if there are these, gov- if the companies used to be owned by the government, then you can kind of have an idea of their class background. And um, yes. it's not. Um, and that, that's actually um, like a counter argument to you know, like the <laughs> post '90s uh, free market fundamentalist. Uh, you know, especially advocated by by U.S. You know, the the the, the economic development in Taiwan and South and South Korea was totally it was not really free market based. It, oh, not at very, all. If it was if it was free market based, Taiwan would be very poor right now. Yes, yes. I mean, it's very much like top down, and, and there's a lot of. Uh, like state, I mean, it's a lot of state interference in the economy, you know, and, and state control. Yeah, and then um, so th- it's really funny because when you have liberals in Taiwan, like especially right wing liberals in Taiwan, they'll be like, "See, like Chiang Kai Shek and the communists were the same because socialism and communism is just when the government does stuff." So if you use that definition for socialism, I guess which is also the definition of socialism that fucking. Bernie Sanders fanboys use, then yeah, I guess you could call it socialist, but that's not. But um, there is also the um. Shit, what was I gonna say? Oh, yeah, I mean, if it was, if the land reform was socialist, there would be you would see things like collective farms and like tractor stations and that sort of stuff. But now it was kind of um, it kind of promoted a um, like a the rise of a middle peasant in the countryside, and then a lot of them like when they weren't. Working on their land, they would work at the nearby factory, and it kind of it was like this sort of arrangement in the countryside. Anyways, section also, six. Sorry. Also, sorry to interrupt again. And also, one of the motivation for KMT to implement the land reform was a lesson they learned on the mainland China. You know, they want to preempt kind of the rural discontent that basically overthrew the rule on, on mainland China. So, so they, they decide, okay, we have to do something, right? Like something that they were ne- never able to do on mainland China itself because their, their political support resides in the landlord class. Uh, but now they get to do it on Taiwan. Yeah. So then um, like this manifesto talks about how um, the KMT, an effort to stabilize its rule, Worked with Taiwanese tycoons, which contributed to rising income inequality. So once again, I, this is going to be, I'm, I'm just analyzing this through a communist lens. Um, this once again, it's um, it, it kind of reflects the petty bourgeois ideal, like um, the petty bourgeois ideals that these people held. I mean, they don't like income inequality when it affects them, but then they also don't want um, they, they don't want socialism. So they want like this sort of idealized version of capitalism where like you can maintain free trade for um for eternity, I guess. Or we can go back to like the in the West we have people who want to go back to like the golden era of free competition, which just you can't do that. It's not how development works, like the historic the development of history. Anyways, section six of um of the manifesto further um demonstrates his very liberal understanding of the state. He says that the state is simply a tool for the benefit of the people. And um, those who face the same predicaments and share the same interests can form a state. So then um, for over 10, whereas, you know, as communists, we believe that a state is a tool for the benefit of a ruling class, which could be, you know, a specific class, depending on the society, like in a capitalist society, you have um the 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 capitalist class and the working class and the capitalist class is the class that is served by the state and the state oppresses you know working class interest now 
with his definition, how like a state or a country is like um, a state is a tool for the benefit of the people, like those who face the same predicaments and share the same interests, blah, blah, blah. It's kind of like kind of like the I- idea of a nation. Anyways, he points out that for over 10 years, Taiwan has been a de facto state. And that's kind of true because um, from 1949 until um, this was written in 1964, the so-called ROC government only effectively administered Taiwan Penghu, uh, Jinmen, and Mazu. And then, and then the manifesto points out that it points to the Nordic states, like and then um, Switzerland, Uruguay, as great examples of small countries that enjoy great standards of living. Which is more petty bourgeois bullshit? Because why do these countries have um, great standards of living? They don't enjoy great standards of living in a vacuum. They benefit from imperialism. And then um, I don't even know where Uruguay comes from. And then he points out how many intellectuals cling on to the belief that the government can peacefully and gradually transform. And he says that the KMT must be overthrown. Now, this is pretty interesting because if you talk to um, mainstream um, independence advocates today, they're kind of pushing for like peacefully and grad- the peaceful and gradual transformation of the so-called ROC into a um, independent Taiwanese republic. They think that um, by amending the constitution and changing certain things, then Taiwan will be an independent country and everything will be great. But base, but the the same the existing class structure and the state apparatus effectively remains the same. Right, but whatever these pe- these people are idealists. I I just like to point out uh, to remind our audience that there there was once a Taiwanese Republic and that existed at the end of the first Sino-Japanese War in 1895 when you know China was forced to cede Taiwan to Japan and and the reason the 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 Republic of Taiwan was formed back then is because, you know, the local gentries on Taiwan, they did not want to become Japanese subjects. So they, so they formed this, this uh, but, but because the treaty signed by China, you know, the, 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 the island was obligated to be given to Taiwan. So they formed the so-called Taiwan Republic to declare uh, independence so, so that they would not be governed by Japan. But, but like they, they they elected the former you know the governor of Taiwan, uh, former Qing Dynasty governor of Taiwan to be like its president. And I mean the the the, the whole, whole reason for the first Taiwanese Republic is people inhabitants um, who who formed the, the the Taiwan Republic wanted to remain Chinese, right? I mean <laughs> I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, we we did talk about this in um the first two episodes. Yes. So for people who are just jumping into this uh, discussion right now, uh, please go visit our previous episode on Taiwan, where we give more detailed um, history of development on Taiwan. Lots Uh, of trivia, too. You get to learn all about um, Dutch fort designs. (laughs) Sorry, that was my little pet uh, 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 interest. I had to I I couldn't contain my enthusiasm. Sorry. Okay, so go, go on. So then um, now the section seven of the manifesto um, outlines the goals and principles of um, the Taiwan independence or well, not, not, not um, Taiwan independence, like, sorry, the, the people who wrote this, the, the people who were behind, who, who were for the um, democratization of Taiwan. They want to overthrow the Chang regime, unite all 12 million Taiwanese, regardless of whether they are Bensengren, like um, people like not native, but, you know, pe- People whose families have been in Taiwan before 1945. When a lot of times people call these people natives, and then everyone thinks, "Oh, they're all like indigenous people." No, most of them are still Han Chinese. It, if we were to talk about um, the indigenous population, that would be a whole like new series, and it's it, it's something that would be cool to talk about, but um, it's not in the scope of the discussion, unfortunately. So they want to. So you can see that um. It's interesting because nowadays the separatists, they kind of play on um, like these identity politics and the splits and the lack of unity. Well, not necessarily lack of unity, but they want to play out the contradictions that exist 
to you know win votes. But over here, they're saying we need to unite all 12 million Taiwanese, regardless of whether they're Ben Sengren or Wai Sengren mainlanders, and then establish a new government. So, and then they want to they want to participate in the UN as part of the so-called free world, and establish diplomatic ties with all peace-loving countries. Hmm, I never, I, I never saw, I, I never heard that they wanted to establish ties with the um, Democratic People's Republic of Korea. But okay, um, and then their principles are your typical, you know, liberal ones like multi multi party government, direct election of state leader, and this is a big deal because the um, the so called president of the so called ROC was not directly elected by the people in Taiwan at the time. It was. Oh, it was elected by the so-called National Assembly, which was in theory elected by the people. But because the um, so-called ROC government lost the mainland, they froze elections because they were like, well, Taiwan's only like a small portion of China. We can't have elections here when the rest of the um, when the rest of China is under communist oppression and don't have the freedom to vote in our government. So, yeah, it, it, you can't. If you understand this context, you see why it's a big deal that they want to um, directly elect their leader. They say that um, for years, China has been stuck in a dichotomy between two extremes, the extreme right and the extreme left. Again, this is centrist and petty bourgeois bullshit. In the words of, um, in the words of Mao Zedong, um, how, how is it translated in English? Carl, he says, um, <laughs> the, Oh, God. The, the centrality is uh it's a farce is a farce yeah that's yeah. a good one that's a good one yes. so basically um they said that we need a third path one of self-salvation and if you think about it third path was all that bullshit that gorbachev tried to push and yeah well taiwan did get a pizza hut too so i guess that worked um and then they mentioned that um they already have great support among their comrades like comrades as in um people who are for who are against the KMT and like for um the democratization of Taiwan and a lot of these people because they're from like petty bourgeois backgrounds they studied abroad or they were exiled or whatever they said that they had great support among their comrades in the US Japan Canada France and Germany and I'm presuming West Germany and then um the authors have reiterated that the main purpose of this document was to gain freedom and democracy. It wasn't necessarily a declaration of independence, but regardless, um, historical revisionists like to call it a um, declaration of independence of sorts. So like I said, um, nowadays, like democratization and um, separatism became kind of a um, two-in-one package. So, um, so yeah, after this document was, well, before this document was published, Peng Mingmin was arrested and thrown in jail. But then he was pardoned after a few years because he had his mom write a letter of apology on his behalf to um Jiang Jie -shi, to Chiang Kai shek. And um of the three authors, um Xie Tongmin was imprisoned the longest. And he served a term for um served a term of ten years. So from this we can kind of pretty much see the petty bourgeois character of um, this whole um, new sort of oppositional force. And much of the organizing happened abroad in you know, places like Japan and the U.S. And um, if you look at the history, in order to go back to Taiwan, many of the organizers surrendered and sold out their comrades. Um, for example, um, there is this one dude, um, Gu Kuanmin. He sold out his comrades to protect his assets in Taiwan and return there. And the people that he betrayed included Xie Tongmin and um, Wei Tingchao, who were two of the three authors of the aforementioned um, manifesto. So, and then it was also pretty much the opportunists that later gained power in the DPP, whereas the principled independence fighters were effectively sidelined. So, hey, Carl. I'm still here. Yeah. Um. So, what, what do you think we should do now? I think. Um. Do you think we should talk about the Dangwai movement, or should we kind of give context and kind of introduce some um, like the Jiang Jingguo era? Uh, 
first. yeah let's uh let's let's talk about a little bit about the context of the Dang Wai movement, which is the Zhang Qingguo era, which is very important chapter of the Taiwan development. I mean, we can talk a little bit about, for example, the the economic development in Taiwan, particularly its industrialization, right? Because one of the common frame of um, the modern the Taiwanese uh, separatist is that you know the, the the Taiwan industrialization really started under the Japanese, which has some truth to it, because you know Japanese they they built some basic infrastructure, um, and, and they, they also implemented um, a universal education, right? But which but basically was to enforce the Japanese rule on the island to 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 bind Taiwan um, as a, a, a suppliers basically of raw commodities to the Japanese Empire and and to better exploit Taiwan's resources. Um, but, you know, the Taiwan's economic development really took off, uh, like, in the Zhang Jingguo era, right? And 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 there are several factors contributed to that. And I wanted to, you know, we talk a little bit about that and to give the context to Taiwan's later development. So, basically, Zhang Jingguo was... The, um, he's the so, son of Chiang Kai-shek, and he was the director of his secret police from 1950 to 1965. And then he became the defense minister from 1965 to 69, vice premier from 1969 to 1972, premier from 1972 to 1978, and then the so-called so, president from 1978 until his death in 1988. So basically, Zhang Jingguo, since his return from the Soviet Union, um, had been groomed by Chiang Kai-shek as, as the heir, right, as the, as the next in line to take over the throne. And, and you know, he was given, uh, in the beginning, he was given, uh, I think he, he, he organized San Qintuan, right? How, how would you characterize San Qintuan? It's like a... Um, kind of kind of like a, like a youth... Um, it, it's supposed to be like... A, Kind of how like the Communist Youth League is to the Communist Party, except San Chintuan was f for the K KMT. Um, but what he but basically that... did was he saw a lot of the things that they had in the Soviet Union that boosted morale or um, instilled ideology or whatever, and then he just kind of flipped it around and made it kind of serve capitalism and serve the KMT. Exactly, exactly, uh, and and uh, and so so Zhang Jingguo was given more and more. Um, role of prominence throughout, uh, you know, the Chiang Kai-shek's rule, especially after he moved to Taiwan. And, and so he was um, involved in a lot of decisions of, like, say, the, the, the Taiwan's uh, economic development and so on and so forth. Yes. He, um, I guess the major, the, one of the most obvious things that happened during his leadership was that the focus of the government shifted from um, Fan Gong Da Lu, or like reclaiming the mainland, to the economic development of Taiwan. I think he realized that if the latter weren't done, then the government would kind of, it, there would be a, re, a repeat of what happened in the mainland, and that it would lose the last bit of support that it still has, and its last bit of legitimacy. So, um, there was something... I think um it was when was it when was the um the what was it the oil crisis that happened in seventy three right? Yeah, that that happened in the early seventies. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of that happened, and you know the economy and the whole world took a hit. So then um it kind of made the further it, it kind of it further highlighted the importance of. Um, economic development in Taiwan. So in 1974, when Jiang Jingguo was still the so-called premier, he began the um, 10 major construction projects, um, which included the North-South Freeway, which today is the um, National Highway Number 1. Kind of runs, it runs through through the uh, west coast of Taiwan from um, like Jilong all the way to the very, the southern end of Taiwan. The electrification of the West Coastline Railway, and then the North Link Line Railway, 
um, Beihui Tielu, and then the um, Chiang Kai-shek International Airport, which is later renamed the Taoyuan International Airport. It's the airport that you fly to if you one of the two airports you fly to if you're going to Taipei, but it's actually it's not actually in Taipei. And then um, the fifth construction project was um, the Taichung Port, the Taichung Port, Taichung Gang. Also the Suao port, Suao Gang, and then the um, large shipyard, which was the um, the Kaohsiung Shipyard of China Shipbuilding, which belonged to the Kaohsiung Shipyard of China Shipbuilding Corporation, Zhongguo Zhaochuan Chang, and then the so, um, so now like nowadays Taiwan is often touted out as like the poster child of um, American lead. Liberalism, right? So liberal, free, free market liberalism. But the, the 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 ironic fact is that the you know the, most of the Taiwan economic development happened super top under, down. Yes, happened under the dictatorship of Chiang Kai Shek and Chiang, his son Chiang Jing Guo, and it was implemented top down and state control. I mean, there was heavy hand of state in every sector of the economy, and the the the, the the, the economic growth in Taiwan was very much uh, state directed and state controlled. Yeah. And there was also the integrated steel mill for um, China Steel Corporation, which was um, in Chinese, it's called um, Zhongguo Gangtian Gongsi. And like, like this steel mill was um, Da Lian Gangchang, Zhongguo Gangtian Gongsi Da Lian Gangchang. And um, there was also the oil refinery and industrial park. Which was the um, Kaohsiung refinery of CPC Corporation, yeah. Um, one of the the state, the then state-owned um, petroleum company, and um, in Taiwan was called the CPC, Central uh, China Petroleum Company. But they, uh, <laughs> okay, it's funny for, because for our then, audience who might not be familiar, uh, CPC is also an acronym for uh, for Communist the, Party of China. For, Communist Party of China, yes. Yeah, even though in a lot of the Western US usage, they, they tend to, CCP. especially Western, they use, tend to use CCP, but the official name is CPC, the, the, the Communist Party of China. You know, it's funny because um, like the, the CPC Corporation used to be called Zhongguo Shiyou, Shiyou, right? But then um, Chen Shui-bian changed the name of it. He wanted to change it to Taiwan Shiyou, but there was like some, like there, there was some trademark issues. So then he changed it to... um. Taiwan Zhongyou. Uh -huh. So then it became Central Petroleum Company, which is still CPC. <laughs> yeah, and there were a lot of these, like, I mean, there was uh, what, China Airlines, right? And, and China Airlines is still called China Airlines, Zhonghua Hanko. Yes. But you're going to notice that um, um, with all, the names of all these corporations, they're not called Taiwan this or Taiwan that. It was always China this or China that. Yes. So this and is fact, kind of, um, this is where, um, these, where um, the separatists in the later years, like in the in the from starting in the two thousands, really wanted to do their ideological work was they wanted to change all of the stuff that had the word China in it into Taiwan. And another thing uh, to remind our audience is until nineteen seventy two, Taiwan uh, Chiang Kai Shek regime still held the seat um, on the UN Security Council as China, right? So it's still, like the, the pretension that Chiang Kai-shek still represent entirety of China was kind of upheld by the United States in at the level of United Nations. And and I remember uh, in 1990, when I first came to US, in the Chicago Public Library, I found this pictorial called Free China Pictorial or something. Like it, it's, it's, the, the pictorial is called Free China, but, but it's really about, Taiwan. <laughs> it was, yeah. Yeah. And then the last, um, the last of the 10 construction companies was the nuclear power plant, the, um, the Jinshan nuclear power plant, which is called, um, Di Heneng Fa Dian Chang, or, um, Jinshan Fa Dian Chang. And it, it's, um, interesting you mentioned that because, um, Taiwan was never in the UN, like, as a country, nor was it ever kicked out because it was the so called Republic of China that was in the UN and it claimed to be representative of all of China and that Taiwan was part of that China. 
what happened was that the so-called ROC got kicked out and got replaced by the PRC. And um, the PRC is remains the representative of the same China that includes Taiwan. It's just because the PRC doesn't um, doesn't actually administer Taiwan currently due to history. Taiwan feels less I down. I mean, like, yeah. there's a lot of, uh, right now, especially in the time of COVID-19 crisis, there's a lot of calls in the um, West among the to- political talking heads about, you know, uh, how how Taiwan is supposedly being excluded by by from uh, WHO, right? And then how Taiwan should be given equal recognition and representation in the international level. But the fact is, even United States government <laughs> only recognize, uh, you know, China, uh, People's Republic of China as a sole re- representative of China. Like there's no, um, even U.S. government or actually none of the government. Well, actually, I put, I take it back. There's about like 13 or 14 government around the world that recognize Republic of China, right? There's, there's about... Um, I don't know what's the number now, 12, 13 countries, uh, mostly in, in um, you know, like Latin America. And a lot of it's, little small islands. There's only one yeah. in Africa now. Yeah. And that, that they're basically still... The Holy See. Yes. Recognize uh, Republic of China because, you know, Taiwan provide uh, very generous funding to these countries to maintain that. Oh, do I want to mention, um, yeah. I want to mention, you know, when when the Pope died, when um, Chen Shui-bian was the leader, you know, um, he attended the Pope's funeral. But like, you know, when you attend the funeral, like the leaders of the world um, are um, standing court, like in alphabetical order according to the countries, right? Uh huh. Chen Shui-bian was was standing next to, I believe, the Brazilian president and first lady. Ah. B so- C comes after B. He wasn't around the T area. <laughs> he wasn't like near Tajikistan, for example. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's interesting. Yeah. So then um there was the um GDP growth was quite phenomenal. It was um let me see. I have this little graph with the um okay, so industry in nineteen fifty two made up um nineteen point seven percent of Taiwan's economy. In the 1960, like it was... I also like to point out that, you know, the, the international environment for Taiwan's development um, is very much tied to the U.S. involvement in East Asia. Like, what the, the what Korean War did for, for example, for Japan was it, it stimulated the, the, the Japanese economy to provide basically for um, for the American military who are going to the Korea, and then uh, similarly, you know, Vietnam War, you know, provided that ex- economic stimulus to countries like South Korea, um, you know, Thailand, and and I believe Taiwan as well. Yes. Yeah, and um, the other thing is basically. Starting from the Korean War and onwards, what we mentioned this earlier, how Japan is the junior partner of U.S. imperialism. But what that basically means is during this time period when um, mainland China was still excluded from um, like trade and like diplomatic relations with a, a lot of a huge chunk of the world. What happened was, um, OK, the Japanese empire no longer existed, but the economic relations that existed were kind of still there. Like you see, like companies in South Korea and um, Taiwan pretty much doing value-added work for um, Japanese corporations. There was a lot of that going on. Yes, it was a kind of holdover from like the, the colonial era because the all the um, colonial era infrastructure was laid down during the Japanese empire and yeah. And all that personal connections and, and uh, it was still there. It was still there and, and it was um, it's just like after World War II, all, all those connect, those networks get uh, shifted to kind of the uh, basically to support the U.S. Milit- 
military presence in East Asia. And and another re, another thing I would like to point out is that the you know the, there's a lot of talk about the so-called bamboo curtain. You know that it, it's, it's always portrayed Mao's China as like it's isolationist and it closed itself off from the rest of the world. And and it's the same rhetoric um, applied that, that was applied to China during the Opium War, basically saying like, you know, China was this isolationist power that wanted to cut off contact with the outside world, which is not true because during, in the Mao era, it was the West, it was the West that imposed the economic sanction and the blockade against China. So, so that's very important distinction. And, and the reason why, you know, China did not take back Hong Kong when you could easily have, when you could, when you easily could have, is that, uh, you know, Hong Kong remained kind of like the sole window for mainland China to trade with, with, you know, broader outside world, especially in the, you know, Western camp during the Cold War. So it's that, that was a reason, main reason that was Hong Kong was allowed to keep its its uh, um, political status as a uh, as a British colony at the time. Yeah. So um, I think I'm gonna go back to the GDP um figures with the um the ten major constructions because um like I said um the constructions began in 1964 right. So let's look at um the percentage of the GDP GDP att attributed to industry. So in 19 52 it was 19.7 percent and 1960 it was 26.9 percent so you saw an increase not by much but still a sizable increase 62 to 6 1960 to 1962 it went from 26.9 percent to 28.2 percent now in 1973 the same figure became 43.8 so it went from 28.2 to 43.8 and then um 11 years later in 1984 it went to 46.2 percent and it kind of stayed in like the mid 40s, lower 40s from then on until the 1990s. So it's um kind of a pretty big deal because if not for this sort this level of industrialization, like it, it would just be a lot of, you know, small production and that sort of stuff. Yeah, it must be pointed out that Taiwan, even though economically speaking, was better off than mainland China at the end of World War II, because of some initial investment by by the Japanese colonialists. But on you know by the world average, Taiwan remained uh, you know a developed country it was still still rather poor. Um, it so was their lot, world. Yes, yes, sir. World. That that's like, that's a when, word. When my when my mom was a little kid, her um, and she's from a pretty well off family. Like, and even her family didn't have a flushing toilet until like later in her life. Yeah, I mean, like the so called, you know, the the Asian the miracle economy, right? The, the the Asian tigers, Taiwan, South Korea. Singapore, Hong Kong, a lot of that development happened in the Cold War era when China, the mainland China, was closed off by mm -hmm. Western sanctions. So, so these these peripheries uh, economy kind of you know plug into the to the, um, the 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 U.S. dominated network. Right uh, in East Asia, and that that's how they were able to prosper, and that's another reason why, you know, like like you, once the China opened up its own economy uh, in the 1980s, you see a lot of the industries get shifted to mainland China itself, and 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 e economies in a lot of these places like Hong Kong and uh, Taiwan starting to stagnate yeah and, but, but then like at the same time you see that um hong kong and taiwanese capitalists were the first to enter mainland china when like you know americans and like japanese and koreans were still like hesitant reluctant and like yes. they were kind of hesitating partly because yes. of the um the cultural affinity and how a lot of them did have connections in the mainland still Yes, in fact, um, that's one of the often ignored uh, aspect of the Chinese development is that, um, you know, in the, especially in the 1980s and 1990s, 
the the initial uh, investment was most overseas investment into China came from the overseas Chinese community, you know, including places like Taiwan and Hong Kong, yes. and as well as uh, you know overseas Chinese um, capitalist class from like places like Southeast Asia. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But it's really funny because a lot of the um, like you know how I mentioned that a lot of the um, independence movement people, it's like its base is in the middle class, like middle class intellectuals, right? And it remains true today. And um, the funny thing is, a lot of them today, like they have parents who like got rich from like investing in the mainland when it opened up. So they were like pretty much brought up on the RMB. Yeah, examples like Huang Guochang and the New Power Party. Like he's a he's a really good example. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like there's a there's a there's a contradiction between the ever tighter economic integration with the Chinese mainland, but the the different um, kind of the, the political aspirations where people. Um, <laughs> want to have nothing to do with China when their economic lifeblood come to increasingly more dependent on China, Chinese market. Yeah. So um, I think now we've provided enough of a um, kind of background to kind of talk about the um, the Dangwai movement. And Dangwai literally means outside of the party. So there was a movement in Taiwan because remember, during this time, parties other than the um, the KMT were banned. <clears throat> so, from the um, mid '70s to the early 1980s, because of the because of the party ban, um, there was um, independence kind of formed a coalition, and like I said, um, like we said earlier, the legislative yuan, which is kind of like parliament, was mostly appointed, but there were still some seats that were open to election. Because um the problem was the, mo the majority of the seats in the legislative union were held by um you know delegates representing constituencies in mainland China, so, and because mainland China wasn't under effective um like so-called ROC control, such delegates were just appointed by the KMT. So there was some room like they there was never enough seats in parliament for the Dangwai people to actually take power, but they saw it as an opportunity to go in and use it as a platform to um, express their views. And um, eventually they formed the Democratic Progressive Party, which um, I guess the name at the time kind of reflects their aspirations, though nowadays they're just like any other bourgeois party. This is important because, you know, the KMT, they have to maintain uh, like a facade of democracy to provide uh, somewhat of legitimacy to their military rule on Taiwan. Um, but that that facade, that that, that structure of, of, of um, that facade of democracy actually provided some kind of a, um, representation, right, which which led to the later evolution. Yes. So during this time, um, there were a lot of um, publications and magazines. They, they were all distributed underground. So, um, and then uh, to avoid censors, they would have censors. They would have to keep changing their names. Like some examples I can think of was what is it? Um, 为你争取百分之百的言论自由 Like, um, how would how would you translate it? How would you translate it? Um. Fighting for your um, for your for total freedom of speech. Yes. Yeah. Like that was one, and um, there were also other, but there was this one called um Meili Dao Zha Zhi, which was um translated into English as Formosa Magazine, and um, for a while the KMT would kind of respond in a limited fashion, but then. <laughs> They weren't really like, they didn't like do like full crackdowns, you know, to maintain the democratic facade, which over time made the um, the Dangwai leaders more confident. Now, um, one of the major turning points in Taiwanese history is the um, the Kaohsiung incident or the Meili Dao Shi Jian, like Formosa incident, which was um kind of basically the people who organized that magazine wanted to organize some sort of like protest, 
and then that got declined. So then they went to another place to to um, register, and then their request also got declined. So then they kind of went through with it anyways. And then um, basically people who were responsible for um, kind of the movement were arrested en masse. For example, like Shi Mingde, uh, Lin Li, Lin Li Xiong, Huang Xinjie, Xu Xinliang, Liu Shoulian. Liu Shoulian um, was the ex vice leader of Taiwan during um, from 2000 to 2008. Chen Ju, Chen Ju was the ex uh, mayor of Kaohsiung City. Um, Zhang Junhong, Yao Jiawen, etc. Just and then because of these mass arrests, you also had a bunch of lawyers who kind of Ended up joining politics. Some of the lawyers include Xie Changting, Chen Suibian, uh, Zhang Junxiong, Su Zhenchang. Any of these names sound familiar? Chen Suibian for sure. <laughs> yeah. Everybody. Chen Suibian. Okay, what about Xie Changting? Um, I I heard of the name Xie Changting, but I'm not very familiar with him. Xie Changting ran opposed to uh, Ma Yingzhou, but he lost to Ma Yingzhou. What about um Su Zhenchang? No, don't ring a bell. Oh, he used to be the um the head of the legislative yuan. Now he's I think he's the premier. He's he's a super ugly dude. Like he's one of the ugliest dudes I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, I I don't want to be like uh, you know judging people's appearance, but uh, um... <laughs> but, but he, he he's an ugly motherfucker. It's like when yes. it's like it's like when he fell down from his family tree, he hit his he hit every single branch on the way down or something. Yes, before yes. landing on his face. Anyways, um. From this incident, you see um, a lot of these people gaining gaining traction in Taiwan. Yeah, and, it's it's and it's mostly from like the professional class, right? You know, like yes, yes, yes. So that's mostly what I really lawyers. want to. Um, that's what I really wanted to highlight. Yes, yes. Uh, it's definitely like a bourgeois movement for sure. Yeah. So then, and around this time, and um, not too long afterwards, 1984, have you heard of the um, Jiangnan An or the Jiangnan case or incident? Yes, yes. I was just going to ask you about that. So, so Jiangnan, he is a Taiwanese writer, but he he's actually based... not considered Taiwanese by Taiwan. Like at the time, like in the era, he wouldn't have been considered Taiwanese because he was born in Jiangsu. He ah, was born in the mainland. Yes. But yes, he so was he... opposed. He was opposed to the Jiang family. Yes, yes. And so he wrote uh he wrote like a biography of Jiang Jingguo, right? Is that right? Yes. He also um, did you know that he worked as a US State Department um translator? No, I did not know that. Yeah, he studied at American University in DC. Mm. Then he became a US citizen. So then he wrote articles, you know, critical of the Chang family and the ruling clique. And then he wrote the, um, the the biography you talked about in 1975, and then he all he had already been warned by you know um, the KMT's network. The KMT had a bunch of networks like around the world. They were like, hey, hey, man, like, bro, cut that shit out. But then he published it anyway. So then, in 1984, he was shot by um, Zhu Lianbang. Zhu Lianbang is called the Bamboo Union, and they're one of the biggest um Weishen gangs and. Taiwan. It's kind of like it's a mafia. They're still around too. So um and the um they were allegedly trained by the Taiwan authorities to carry out this assassination. So it's probably true, but there's no definitive evidence, and it's argued whether or not Jiang Jingguo was responsible for dispatching. Dispatching them to, you know, carry out this mission. Whereas pro Jiang Jingguo people will say that Jiang Jingguo didn't know about it, but those who were loyal to him kind of ordered it to be done behind his back. But yeah, I mean, it doesn't there's... matter. The point is that there was this sort of um, 
like the the government on Taiwan did resort to such measures to um, silence its political opponents, which, you know, I, I like to tell this to people in Taiwan. They look at the U.S. as some sort of beacon of democracy and point to this as like the opposite of the U.S. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. This is nothing compared to like the shit the U.S. does. They learned this kind of stuff from the U.S. Hello? Yeah, I mean, I mean, Taiwan uh, security state has a very close tie with with U.S. from very beginning. Yes, I mean, from from, from the days of uh, from the days of you know, even back to trace back to the days of Chiang Kai Shek on on uh, on mainland China. I mean, like like there's a he has. Zhang Kai She and through his wife, uh, Madam Zhang uh, Song Meilin, they had they, they they had some very uh, right wing allies in the United States, especially among the cons- conservative Republicans. Yes, it's um, and then like I mentioned, like the Taiwan's um, intelligence network was pretty much like kind of um, right wing ideology, but with Soviet efficiency. And that, uh, in large part, thanks to you know Jiang Jingguo, right? Who was yeah, studying in the Soviet the... Union. Yes. Oh, by the way, um, fun fact, um, for those who don't know, um, the first lady of um the so-called ROC from you know the late seventies until the late nineteen eighties was actually Soviet. Jiang yes. Yang. She's yes, um she... Belarusian, I believe. Yes, yes, she's from Belarus, and uh, Zhang Jingguo, like back in nineteen twenty, early nineteen twenties, that's when um, Soviet Union supported Sun Yat-sen's government in base in Guangzhou, right in Canton, and that's when Chiang Kai-shek sent his son Zhang Jingguo to Soviet Union to study, and while in Soviet Union, uh, while while Zhang Jingguo was in Soviet Union, you know Chiang Kai-shek. <laughs> Proceeded with the purge of the communists in 1927. So after that, Zhang Jingguo was kind of stuck in, in Soviet Union for 10 years. Uh, so during that time, he joined the Communist Party of Soviet Union, and he also met and married uh, Fang Nia, who was from Belarus. Yeah, and he was also classmates with Deng Xiaoping. Yes, yes. So so Deng Xiaoping. Um, for a brief period in 1920s, uh, before the KMT CCP split, when um, you know on his way back from from Europe, uh, took the took a uh, stop by in Moscow. So they both attended the I think it's called the Sun Yat-sen, the Toiler uh, of the East. Uh, it's a, so so basically Sun Yat-sen University uh, uh, at Moscow and. Um, and 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 Deng Xiaoping actually became very fr- good friend with Zhang Jingguo while there, because I think they're about the same age, and uh, and then uh, and then after that Deng Xiaoping left um, to come back to China. Uh, I think that's probably the last time they those two spoke face to face. Yeah, I think the name that he went by when he was in the Soviet Union as a student was um, Deng Xixian. That's what um, Zhang yes. Jingguo knew him as. Yeah, yes, that that's Deng Xixian was uh, kind of Deng Xiao Deng, Deng Xiaoping is is adopted name, right? Like Deng yeah. Xixian is his his original. These are his original Chinese. It's not no his um his um his original name was um Xiansheng. Oh right, 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 right. So that was the name he used when As Deng Xiaoping traveled travel yeah. yeah through Europe, um and and so. Yeah, so so at the time when they were both in Moscow, they spent a lot of time together because they were, you know, similar age, similar interest. Uh, you know, at that time, you know, Zhang Jingguo was still, uh, you know, considered a progressive <laughs> youth, um, and and so he married uh, Fania, and then in 1937, because of the coup launched by uh, young Marshal Zhang Xueliang in Xi'an, in the so-called Xi'an incident where uh, Zhang Xueliang, the, the, the Manchurian warlord, arrested Jiang Kai-shek, who was uh, in Xi'an to supervise the final uh, extermination campaign of the, 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 the Chinese Red Army. And the, then the Zhang Xueliang forced Jiang Kai-shek to agree to form a united front with the communists to fight the Japanese. So as a result of that, 
you know, um, basically Zhang Jingguo was allowed to return to China, return back. So he he and Fang Nia they 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 returned to China, and after that, Zhang Kaixie started grooming him to basically to take over. Yeah. So, anyways, um, back to the point, like how how this all ties in with the Zhang Jingguo era, was um. As we can see, with the rising middle class in Taiwan, you see more and more intellectuals who are against the authoritarian dictatorship of the KMT, and they wanted more. Um, they wanted a more democratic society. But because the government was um, dominated still at even up until the eighties by um, new arrivals from the mainland, and like because of um, the way Taiwanese society worked. If you were like an elite and you were a mainland elite, you didn't really intermingle with um, non-mainlanders. So it's kind of interesting because you see like um family military families who are like working class who ended up in Taiwan. They pretty much a lot of them ended up learning the local dialect and stuff like that. But then we you have people like um Ma Yingzhou. He didn't learn he didn't learn Minahua until he ran for leader in um two thousand eight. There is that sort of divide, and Ma Yingzhou was like. Well, he was born in Hong Kong, but um, he he grew up in he grew up in Taiwan. He wasn't like um Jiang Jingguo or Jiang Kai Shek, who like grew up in the mainland. And even then, like there's this there's this sort of isolation. So you can see how um the dissatisfaction with the KMT kind of got bundled in with desire for um independence because um these people. Because people were sick of being dominated by these um, very reactionary people from the mainland, who so it, often live apart from the, you know, especially the elite of whom live apart from the local populace. You know, they live in their own compounds, you know, from from people, you know, that came over with them. Yeah, but the unfortunate thing is there is a huge working class that came from the mainland in nineteen. You know, from forty five to forty nine, and there's also a um, there's also like a bourgeois class and like a rich class among the um Bensengren. but then the sort of um the sort of be- because of the the sort of um arrangement among like provincial lines, people kind of associated like mainlanders with that sort of power, which is why. Which is why, at the end of the day, when the DPP gained when the DPP gained power, it was still able to become like a fully bourgeois party because even among like even among the Bensengren, there were capitalists who were opposed to the KMT, but they weren't really opposed to the um the way the government was, the way um class society was organized. Would you agree? Yeah. Yep. So, basically, with all of this pressure, Jiang Jingguo was kind of forced to. Um, martial law was ended in the eighties, like towards the end of his leadership. It was either him or Li Donghui that did. I need to. I need to look. Um, look it up. I think we can talk about th- this. Will be a main topic for the um the next episode. But um, yeah, an- another huge change that happened was um. In nineteen seventy, was it nineteen seventy nine? The U.S. formally, like, finally cut off diplomatic ties with the government on Taiwan, and recognized the PRC as the sole legitimate government of China. I mean, that started with、uh, 1972 when yeah, yeah, yeah. the Republic of China got kicked off, kicked out of the、uh, UN, and、uh, you know, with PRC government officially taking seat on the UN Security Council as representative of China. I mean. That that came about sort of as like the、uh, approachment between U.S. and and China after Nixon. But interestingly, in the U.N. vote, you know, U.S. and then most of the、uh, its, its Western allies were against. But you know, you know, Soviet Union and uh, uh, India and and rest of the most of the third world nations. Africa plays a huge role. Yes. Yes. So, so that 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 I mean, it was very like、uh, you know, like a Cold War kind of、uh, um, played out how the UN Security Con- Security Council voting and and you know so, but that kind of started the process of 
you know, a PRC becoming the official recognized legitimate government of all of China. And 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 the, a lot of the, the, so 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 enough up to this moment, you know, the in the ruling elite of Taiwan kind of you know pose itself as so representative of China. So the, the, many of them actually felt and, and many people who subscribe to this ideology felt betrayed by by the by the UN uh, decision and by you know subsequent US uh, diplomatic recognition of China. And yeah, I want was... to tie this with the um the Meili Dao incident. Okay. Yeah. Because um this kind of the formal cut like the cut of diplomatic ties with the US and Taiwan kind of um it, it was a um tense time in Taiwan because it had just lost its like for the longest time, it was like its source of um, legitimacy. The um for the so called ROC, and as you can see, the democratic, the, the pro democratic forces, albeit you know, like bourgeois democracy. But anyways, they were against this whole um, yeah, we're we're the real China type of thing. So then you could see why in 1979 the the magazine organizers like were um were finally cracked down on and they were like just sentenced they were all like it was mass sentencing they were like um Ximing though was sentenced to life but he didn't serve life because you know because of later developments but they were all ser- they, they were all sentenced to at least like 10 years in prison well, let's just, see. Uh, just a side note um the Mainida or Formosa is a Portuguese word um, that originally when the Portuguese sailors came to East Asia, they, uh, you know, they supposedly, uh, they, 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 they put claim of Formosa when they first saw the land of Taiwan. And that name kind of stuck, um, at least among the English language usage. Uh, but the name of Taiwan, as we talk about in one of our first episodes was came from the name of a indigenous tribe uh, of Taiwan in, in in southern Taiwan that when that the Dutch came in contact with when uh, they first colonized Taiwan and and so so now like the the two names for Taiwan are kind of used interchangeably among the English. Uh, um, among in the English language medium, but but I, I what I noticed was that the the, the pro independence uh, people uh, they seem at, at least in certain periods in certain contexts they like to use Formosa. I don't like yes, Formosa because Formosa sounds more it's more foreign. It's more yeah. it's not Chinese. You know, like like but Taiwan I, wasn't originally Chinese either. either. The name it's like the most indigenous name of all of the ones used. Yes, but 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 you know, but but Formosa give you the air of you know like oh you know it's Portuguese, it's European. Well, it's it's a, it's a good name for them because they're all sycophants of the West. Yes, yes. But anyways, like in the mass arrests, like for example, Chen Shui-bian was the um lawyer was the lawyer for um Huang Xinjie, who was a um Dang Wai, Dang Wai legislator. Um, and then um Xie Changting. Su Zhenchang were, they're all like major figures in the DPP nowadays, by the way. They were lawyers for this dude, um, Yao Jiawen. So you can see like how these people ended up crawling up the ranks. And a lot of these people like, um, a lot of them, they were um, like in the Dangwai movement. So they were in the government, but they were still like just arrested in mass after this whole incident. So anyways, with enough pressure, the KMT was forced to kind of slowly end its um, like overtly dictatorial rule. And then there was also another thing that was going on. There were these um, soldiers from the mainland, like military families, like just walking around Taipei with signs on them that said Xiang Jia, like we, we, like we miss home. It's kind of like um, it was a call for the government to end the travel ban to the mainland because the they were approaching death and or, or old age, but not necessarily death, and they really wanted to go back. 
I mean, a lot of them, that their parents had already died, but there were still some whose parents in the mainland were still alive, and they just really wanted to go visit them and visit all the relatives that they still could before either them, they themselves or their relatives passed away. And by that point, it became an open secret that if you wanted to go to mainland China, you could just go to Hong Kong and then go to the mainland from there. And all sorts of different, all sorts of mounting pressures on the um, Jiang Jingguo government that prompted a lot of change. So in the 80s, um, travel restrictions were lifted. I believe at first they were lifted for people who had family there. And then later they became like gradually, um, it, it, travel to the mainland became gra gradually became open to the rest of the Taiwanese population. And it's interesting because um, I think some of the listeners might be curious as to, well, if the two governments don't recognize each other and they both cl claim to be the sole legitimate government of China, then how do they travel over there? Because you can't, they can't recognize each other's passports, right? Okay, are you going to explain? Yeah, I, I, I was hoping for, for you to say, like, uh, yeah, so, like, whatever. I think there's also a delay in our audio, which is kind of, um, like, fucking up the effect that I'm trying to, whatever. Um, so, yeah, there's, um, they have special, we have special travel passes. So, like, when, when we go to the mainland, we don't use our um, so-called ROC passports. We have this, it used to be, like, a separate document that looked kind of like a passport. It was called, like, the... Um, travel pass for Taiwan pres for Taiwan residents to the mainland. But nowadays it's just a card. It's like a card ID. Yeah, so we use that. And the mainland has like its like equivalent that they use for when they travel to Taiwan. And the <clears throat> the political context for this is also, you know, the the cultural revolution came to an end basically in 1976. Um, and and the mainland was experiencing its own reform and opening. And at the time, you know, mainland China was welcoming, um, you know, like more interaction with outside world, including overseas investment. So it was actually courting, you know, investors from, say, Hong Kong and Taiwan. And also it was welcoming the, because um, there's a lot of, we talk kind of talk about like the Cold War era um, in Taiwan last episode and how ridiculous was like the, the, the KMT propaganda on Taiwan, et cetera. But there was similar phase of that on the mainland also. I mean, during Cultural Revolution, anyone who has like overseas family background became suspect. And then like there was a lot of stigmatization associated with that. You know, you, you don't want to have overseas family connections back then. But in, in 1980s, that kind of flipped around, you know, it became like, it became prestigious. It became great to have overseas uh, <clears throat> Uh, connections, you know, when you, we see, like, I lived in China in 1980s, um, and I remember one, um, one of my elementary school classmate who had, a, like, an uncle or somebody who, from, who went to Taiwan, basically, and, and, like, you know, then they came back to visit, and it was a big deal, it was a big deal in, in, um, like, the area we live. And like, you know, people, people, some people even look upon it as with envy, where it's like, oh, you know, they got rich overseas uncles. <laughs> who they get Nike gifts. shoes. Yes, 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 yes. Who, who have, because at the time, you know, China was very different place, like to buy imported goods, you know, you, you, you can't, you can't just buy with money. You have to have like a special uh why would you have like a like a foreign exchange certificate a node right and and you only get those if you say if you went to exchange um you know us dollars with rmb at the bank they give you something like that so so you can't just use like regular rmb and, and buy overseas imported overseas luxury goods you have to have these special certificate and and you know people returning to China from overseas, of course, they will have these kind of, you know, certificate and, and those, those are like highly sought after items like that enable you 
to go to the special stores where you can buy like imported Japanese radio and and so on and so forth. So so yeah, it, it's 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 back then it's like it was great if you know if you had an overseas uncle or something. You should visit Cuba then. They still have a Whitehui Chen. Ah, really? Okay. That, that they have two sense. currencies. One of them is the CUC, which is one to one with the USD, and then they have like their CUP, which is like the local currency, which is I believe twenty five to one. Yes, yes. Because at that time, I remember RMB and and dollar exchange rate was state mandated to be like one to three, like one US dollar to three RMB. But that doesn't mean you can go to the bank and use this three RMB to get one US dollar. Quite, <laughs> it's, you would be actually be quite impossible, right? And so for a lot of people who want to get US dollar, for example, to go abroad, they have to resort to, if they can't go through the official channels, they actually go resort to black market, which has a much higher rate. Um, and and uh, yeah, it was it was uh, interesting. I mean, nineteen eighties was was interesting times in China because it's the, the society was gra- it was suddenly opened up, um, and a lot of the so, like all of a sudden we are able to watch uh, TV dramas from Taiwan, from Hong Kong. Uh, you know, Chong Yao was big. <laughs> Chong Yao, Yao is a, like a romance novel writer from Taiwan, and and her her work was a. Was was big, and all the Taiwan TV dramas based on Chongyao uh, novels were were a big hit in, in China at the time. Yeah, the eighties was pretty interesting because um, for the first time, it was when um after the revolution, it was like the first time where um you got like more and more people from Taiwan visiting the mainland and seeing what things were like. But and, unfortunately, and- mainlanders couldn't go to Taiwan until much later. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was very much one sided and and also the and I remember there was a famous uh, incident. So in in my dad's home province of Zhejiang, right, they, they there was a, a, a kind of tourist attraction at it's like a man made reservoir, Qian Dao Hu, uh, literally Thousand Island Lake. It, it was a it was a man made reservoir that turned into like a tourist attraction. Um, so a lot of Taiwanese tourists go visit, and I believe he is seen either eight, late eighties or early nineties. There was a Chen Daohu incident where um, a, a, a tour tour tourist boat full of Taiwanese tourists were attacked by basically local local gangs who uh, who you know robbed the the tourists and to destroy the evidence and killed everybody and 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 burn the burn the burn the evidences. And it, it, it was it caused a huge shock in Taiwan, especially, you know, it's right around the time when the, the free travel to mainland just opened up a lot of especially a lot of the older uh, generation, like the, the, the uh, KMT soldiers who went to Taiwan are coming back to mainland to visit their families. And and in, in a way, the Chen Daohu incident was also used by, you know, by people who like some anti mainland people in Taiwan to you know to kind of portray this mainland as this kind of lawless place where unscrupulous people who will just you know prey on these innocent Taiwanese tourists. Um, yeah. Hello. Yeah. Um. So I wanted to um talk about how um eventually the um the Taiwan movement came to form the Democratic Progressive Party like we've mentioned many times. And um, another overarching theme of this whole um, episode was how the fight for um, democracy was kind of like a um, bundled deal with separatism due to uh, many historical factors. And, um, you know, during the Tangwai movement, actually wasn't really all Ben Sengren. There were some Wai Sengren involved. And um, one of them actually ran for chairman of the DPP when it first formed. Did you know about this? No. No. He um he actually lost by only one vote to um Jiang Pengjian. But um he quit the but he quit the DPP in nineteen eighty eight. So he, before he was a um, 
Wai Sheng, like a uh, legislator. Wai Sheng, like mainland legislator. He was from um, Liaoning province. And he was part of the Dangwai movement. And he was in the, D- in the DPP. But then he quit the party in 1988. Because he, his reasoning was he thought that the DPP had become um, a Taidu Fascist. Taidu Fascist Dang. Which is kind of accurate. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was um, so for the listeners and um, Western listeners, he said that the DVP beca- had become a um, fascist independence party. Which is kind of true. I mean, the, the it's like fascism you know, light. I, I don't think I don't yes. think most people in the DPP are um, you know, actively or consciously fascist, but they have the right leanings that when crisis comes, they will be pushed to fascism. It, it's because it's very. Um, it's, 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 how do I, I mean, DPP stands for Democratic, uh, 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 Progressive Party. And, but, but it's really based on, in its later iteration, we're now just talking about how it evolved into its present, uh, reincarnation. But in its later iteration, it's increasingly become more kind of the, the party for the... Yeah, for the for the and for the Minan, uh, it, 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 it kind of it, it play a lot of identity politics. Yes, I mean, yes, yes. Major major important platform of DPP is identity politics. It, it, it's it's dividing Taiwan electorate into you know the the, the by 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 language groups, and, and you try to appeal to you know the of course the largest largest Populism. group. Or, yeah, who are the Minnan speakers? I mean, if you think of, uh, if you can call it like the Minnan speaker or or so-called Haklo nationalist, Haklo nationalism. That's that's kind of would describe DPP platform. I, I like to, I, I like to call them Hoklo um, Haklo uh, chauvinists. Yes, yes, that's better, even better. Yeah, yeah. But, um, this kind of goes to show that when a um, political movement is led by the petty bourgeoisie it wavers and um they don't it, it becomes um conciliatory and once it and it becomes bought off by the existing power structure like can we say that the power structure in taiwan has changed too much it certainly there have been great changes in like the politics and how you know the, the representation I, I mean nowadays it's um Everyone in the government is like born and raised in Taiwan and of Taiwan. It's not like in the past where they were all just like mainlanders. Well, firstly, because it's been long a long enough time that all the mainlanders have become like Taiwanized, essentially. But besides that, there were no there was no more like um bar- barriers to entry for um Bensengren. But the class barriers are still there, wouldn't you agree? You had to pay like deposits to um run for office like even at the um, city council level who can afford that i mean the dpp is a democratic progressive party they're not opposed to uh you know the the class hierarchy they're, exactly they, exactly they, my, they my point... wanted everything as is but with with their people on top <laughs> yes yes what i'm saying is um with like um with social movements that are led by the petty bourgeoisie that don't follow a proletarian line this inevitably happens. You get bought off and it becomes like Pokemon. You have like the red version and a blue version. Or gold version, yeah, silver version. You become, you become mired in identity politics as we see in Taiwan. Yes, definitely. And I mean, this is unfortunate because a lot of like there are legitimate reasons for such identity politics. But the way that identity politics there is utilized isn't really to um, resolve the conditions that led to them in the first place, but as a way to win votes and um, split the people, divide and conquer. I mean, mean, this is, uh, this is actually a problem afflicting many liberal democracies. I mean, it's, it's for the, for the politicians, you know, why do they spend a lot of time on socially divisive issues uh, like cultural issues? Because why? Because it's so much easier to strike a stand um, against something 
or for something when you actually don't have to do anything. Right. I mean, it's, yes, it's yes. like playing identity politics. It's, it's easy. You can you can say I'm for this. I'm against that. But uh, you actually distract from the other issue of the day, which is, you know, maybe the economic disparity or, or the economic uh, stagnation or the or the all the. Um, oh, those things matter. Those things matter. If 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 you are um, if, how do you say it in English? Uh, opposition party. If you're the opposition party, but when you're in power, they don't matter anymore. Like all of a sudden, they stop mattering. Yeah, I mean, so, like, like during like, my angels, during my angels time, like the DPP would not stop talking about workers' rights and income inequality and all that stuff. But then, as soon as Tsai Ing-wen got, was elected in 2016, none of that mattered anymore. And then nowadays, like now, the KMT is like talking about all that stuff again. But as soon as they go into power. It's yeah, and it's gonna be. I the mean, reverse. it's like uh, it's like the the U.S. now, right? Like we have the so-called two-party system, but yeah. really, you know, what what's the difference between <laughs> Trump and Biden? You know, you you're gonna have a lot of people jump out and say, oh, you know, but Trump is so so uh, you know, so racist, and then and, and all that, oh, and how can you stand for that? Well, I mean, look at Biden. <laughs> I mean, like, well, well, this is like really terrible choices were presented here, and 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 it's. And even that, I mean, it's like it don't, don't really give you. It's supposedly a representative democracy, but look at what DNC has done to like Sanders, right? Oh and, yeah. And Sanders campaign. I mean, there's not even a. Uh, I mean, even it's 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 so. I mean, the system has always been crooked, but it has never been so apparent, right? To the to the point where, where the ruling elite doesn't even care about a, keeping up the appearance anymore. Yes. <laughs> it's, and that's the case with um the with Taiwan. It's a similar case with Taiwan, but um the issue of um independence and reunification is like a very effective way to mask it all. And um nowadays, you, in, in addition to the DPP and the KMT, you have like a bunch of other parties. Like one of the biggest op, one of the biggest um, third parties is called the um the the New Power Party, Sudai Li Liang. And on this, they, they they dress themselves. It's also a petty bourgeois dominated party. They dress them up in this sort of less leftist veneer, but it's pretty much just a petty bourgeois version of the DPP at this point. They talk about workers' rights and all that stuff, but then if you look at like their platform, it's pretty much the same as any like Maidanesque party, like you know, like in Ukraine, like the those like populist, quasi-fascist, like progressive parties that aren't like you know. So if you want to see how like fascist tendencies can like dress themselves up in um progressive clothing and packaging, look no further than Taiwan. Yes, I mean it, it, this is apparent to both of us. But can you explain it and break it down a little bit for our, for our audience who might not be familiar with the Taiwan politics? Uh, what do you mean? I think this is like a very um, broad topic. That I mean, it, I might, mean, why, it might be why, better if we um, if we get into it and um, when we get into more present times when we actually go in depth if like you know things like um, the sunflower movement and stuff like that. Ah, yes, yes. But but, but... maybe you can just talk about why how you know. Why? What's your what's the basis for calling the DPP fascist light, right? So we're not just throwing out labels. Well, I mean, um, what is fascism? Fascism is, at the end of the day, it's an attempt to maintain the existing class structure. I mean, that's not all fascism is, but that's an important part of. Fascism, like a lot of times, like liberals don't liberals want you to think that oh, fascism is just like you know Nazi death camps, but anything short of that is not fascism. Basically, it's uh, the base. The basis of fascism is, I mean, it serves the capitalist class, but its support base lies in the disin like the the middle class that's being um slowly disenfranchised and being like pushed into the working class, and things aren't as good as they used to be. And then um, instead of looking at like class issues, what happens in Taiwan now is like the DPP just blames a very abstract China. Like, oh, all yes. these problems exist because we because we're isolated in the um, international community. And OK, yeah, the so-called ROC government's not represented in it, like many inter international institutions anymore. But 
there's still economic ties and all sorts. They're just informal now, but they still exist. Like all the ties, like trade ties, cultural ties, all of that stuff. But then, like, uh, but but like, actually, I it's very it's very form that. it's 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 all this stuff is formal formalism because you look at countries like, for example, the DPRK, North Korea, they're recognized by most countries by many countries in the world. But then they're actually cut off from the rest of the world. Or Cuba, they're actually cut off through economic sanctions and like political sanctions and like isolation. It's it, you can't compare like the level of like isolation that um Taiwan is so called like is apparently put through is nothing in comparison to what like the DPRK or Cuba go through. Oh, uh, speaking of that, uh, I mean you know the Taiwan economy had was so. Far intertwined uh, with the Chinese mainland economy, that will be my puppies. Um, they always like to uh, put their two cents into the discussion. But you know that the the the, the, in, in, the close intertwined economic relationship be, between Taiwan and mainland happened in 1980s, uh, and it has really never looked back. But you know, there's a conscious uh, effort among the Taiwan elite who are um, of the more separatist tendencies, you know, start from Li Denghui, right? They have pro tried to actually promote this uh, reorientation of Taiwan economy away from the Chinese mainland. You know, yes. this is a so-called um, go south strategy, right? Yes. Try to encourage the Taiwan business to uh, basically divest from, from mainland and go invest elsewhere in Southeast Asia in places like Vietnam, Indonesia, etc. I mean, I mean, but you know, DPP ha has has trying to say that's you know that is a destiny for for years. You know, yes. that Taiwan needs to move away from China, right? So, and so, to so, legitimize this sort of strategy, they need to um, ingrain into the minds of the people that hey you guys have nothing to do with china so in school we're not we're going to start learning less chinese history and start focusing more on taiwan which you know okay to be fair very fair there needs there there needed to be more focus on like local taiwanese history in the past when like the kmt didn't do a good job with that but they're framing it as like okay we need to learn it at the expense of learning about like you know mainland china and like that history because to be honest you can't understand Taiwanese history without understanding like like the rest of Chinese history. And yes, I yeah. know that there is an indigenous population in Taiwan and that um there were early Han settlers and they were sidelined and everything. Yes, that is something that really needs to be further discussed. But guess what? The DPP doesn't do any shit about that. DPP DPP does not represent DPP doesn't give a shit about of, of Aboriginal Brittany. people. Yes. <laughs> I'm just going to say that right now. Nor nor does the KMT, but at least the KMT, okay, they both don't care, but the KMT has the, I don't want to say decency, but they have the, they have the, the common sense to go buy their votes, like, yes. in Eastern Taiwan. So then, like, you have, what I really hate about, like, some DPP supporters, like, who are, you know, Han, is they'll say things like, oh, we're Aboriginal people so stupid, they vote against their interests by voting for the KMT, when, like, there's, like, an actual party, the DPP, that truly represents their interests. And it's like, no, the DPP doesn't represent their interests either. But the KMT buys their votes. So if you were them, who would you vote for? The one who buys your votes or the one that doesn't? Yeah. <laughs> That's... And I mean, I mean, like... And I don't, I don't even know how the claim that DPP represent Aboriginal interests even can, can you know, come from. I mean, is this just... It's uh, silly. Yeah, that's just ridiculous. I mean, the, the, and, it, and I also like this is the problem with liberal democracy is like none of this stuff, all this stuff gets brought up as talking points for like the capitalist class, like to, you know, to the varying factions of the capitalist class to win their fights over one another and to maintain their overall class rule over the rest of us. But then when it comes time to deal with these issues, they don't do shit. So yeah. what does that leave us? It just leaves a more divided, a more divided, like um, working Which is class, great more divided. The which is great for the status quo and for the for the elite in power. I mean that that was <laughs> that was yeah. designed. It was not a bug, it's a feature. It is and, a feature. So and then like so then I think I think it's fascist because like for example like many of the issues in German society that like Mussolini you know that Hitler brought up or like the issues in 
Italian society that Mussolini brought up were real issues, but then they were they miss instead of blaming like a certain class, they have a convenient scapegoat. Like in 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 Germany, it was the Jews. In Taiwan, it's like a very abstract mainland China, and like people will yes. say, "Oh, we hate the we we hate the government, but we don't hate the people." But then you'll see like a more increasingly um, increasing amounts of um anti mainland sentiments, like just targeting. Oh mainlanders and like just saying this very nasty things to just common mainland folks which that, is quite disgusting I, that's that that has you know like i can tell a story like i when i came to united states in 1990 right the, at the time uh the immigration to us among the chinese community and mostly came from you know taiwan or hong kong this is an artifact of you know us immigration laws because uh, you know the, the immigration from, from mainland was highly highly restricted you know in the cold war and so when i first came to us in 1990 um, you know it's either the, the, the chinese in us were either uh, descendants of earlier wave of a uh, of migration from like you know the the <laughs> from the from the from the um from the eras of building the railroad which is like the the, the cantonese speaking population or um you know the newer uh, wave of Im- immigration from hong kong and taiwan from also like, vietnam uh, after yeah. the after um the liberation of the south much yes. of the chinese community immigrated well, yeah, that that that's a different yeah. That, there's that's a different subsection of the of of the overseas Chinese. Yeah, and yeah. and then um, uh, which is interesting. Uh, just to go t- tangent a little bit because the uh, I lived in Chicago, right? Chicago had two Chinatowns, uh, like a, like an older Chinatown was populated by like the the, the, the Cantonese uh, speakers from come from the older immigrant way, but the, the the newer way from the from from South Vietnam, um, you know, they they actually didn't get along with the <laughs> with the older group of immigrants, so they had their own separate Chinatown. Uh, on the oh, North funny! Side. I got into a fight at work the other day with um, one of those um the Chinese Vietnamese. <laughs> oh, how? What happened? Oh, uh, that's something stupid. I'm like, oh, okay. We were very okay. we were very busy in the kitchen, and you know things got heated. <laughs> okay. And, I only got to use and... Vietnamese curse words I learned from my Vietnamese friends, though. <laughs> yeah. So even though you know most of the Chinese immigrant, oh, oh, most of the Chinese diaspora in Vietnam were uh especially in south vietnam were cantonese speaking right but there was still kind of the two groups still didn't get along because there's significant cultural differences uh that yes. they they have their own separate chinatown in in, in uh, like a northern part of chicago anyway so oh man i lost my train of thought <laughs> oh um we were talking about earlier um you know we were talking about fascism Basically, is uh, kind of manipulated populism, right? And and, yes. and 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 then kind of instead of uh, doing class analysis, it kind of try to uh, a lot Anything of time, but. a lot of time trying to form among uh, a form along the line of like kind of uh, identity, identity, like yes. in group, out group. Yes. Yes, I mean, in that way, yes, I can see how you can apply that to DPP and Taiwan. And and uh, just to give an adult, I don't, I don't totally blame them though, because like for years and for decades in Taiwan, you had the Japanese imperialists, and then you had Chiang Kai Shek's KMT, which is quasi fascist. Yes. Yes. Um, but- so this is like a mirror image. Like what I like to say is what um the DPP nowadays, what a lot of the separatists are pushing for is a return to the um, economic miracles of or so-called economic miracles of the Jiang Jingguo era but with a new flag yes but i i'd like to point out also all these populism and uh, what you call fascism actually lead to some very ugly sentiment you know um on the ground level i mean i was uh uh, so I was in in U.S. Uh, since 1990, uh, and I went when, when I went to Caltech after 95. You know, most of my classmates who are of Chinese background or heritage, are, you know, I was one of the few person from mainland among the undergrad. And one of my classmates who was 
uh, you know, Thai, who, who, whose parents are from Taiwan, he, he said something about, we're just having a normal conversation and, and like, it's totally unrelated. And some, some, he just interject with something about, oh, you know, the, the, the people from mainland are so poor. They, 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 they you know, there were no pants and then they, then, then so, something really stupid. And then he started laughing hysterically. I, I just look at this guy and like, well, you know what's funny at that point, he still called himself Chinese in the nineties. Yes. Yes, yes, that's true. That's true. We're gonna get into that uh, about the, the the shift in 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 the in the identity. Um, and but but the, there was also like in that kind of um, kind of uh, contempt for the mainlanders. There's a deep ingrained classism element of it. You know, it's oh, because certainly. because the mainlanders uh, in general back then were poor. You know, compared to people of Taiwan. Um, you know, this is you know. China was just just opening up and developing in 1980s and 1990s when when China finally opened up to travelers from Taiwan and and you know Taiwan through its economic development in the 70s have you know pulled ahead and was in general much more wealthier than than the mainland cousins so 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 like yeah a lot of uh, um, uh, <laughs> and now it doesn't work anymore though because like living standards in the mainland are rising rapidly so now instead of making fun of them for being poor now it's just laughing like saying oh, they don't right. like, they don't understand freedom and democracy like they, they, they don't understand like they're so brainwashed and they believe everything that Xi Jinping says yeah but the, you know the, the funny thing is you know a lot of the Taiwan media content are now accessible by netizens from mainland china you know like one of the tv i argue shows. i argue that people in the mainland watch more taiwanese media than most taiwanese people like watch mainland media oh, I, I i believe that I, I i'm believe... an exception i watch like a lot of i watch a lot of both <laughs> yeah uh one um so so several years ago there was this taiwanese uh, talk show host um he talked about Oh yeah, you know the the, the the now the mainland economy is gonna go down. You know now like the 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 this living standard had deteriorated to the point where you know they can't afford to buy cha ye dan right the the tea eggs and that became like a lot like a mean on the mainland internet. You know like they, <laughs> people would always say something. Yeah, you were right. We're so poor we can't afford to eat cha ye dan the tea eggs. What's I mean, really which sad is, is a lot of the um anti-china propaganda that's drummed up like they westerners buy them because they don't understand yes. china but yes. th th it's even working in taiwan because so many people just don't understand mainland china nowadays like for example there was that video of the um the uyghur woman crying when she was marrying this han chinese man yes and they were like oh see like this is proof of um oh yeah the story was that uh, all the men in Xinjiang were sent to concentration camps and all the yeah. women were forced to marry Han, like Han men, which, yes, dude, that, that's pretty, like, the logistics of that is pretty impressive if it were real, but, I mean, it's, it's obviously bullshit. But, yeah. see, people only buy that because they don't understand the culture. They don't understand that in right. Uyghur culture, like, you're supposed to cry like that if you were marrying, like, if you were a woman marrying into a, like, in, into another man's family. And and the, 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 just not not even about like say say Uyghur culture. I mean, a lot of the I find a lot of the people in Taiwan and Hong Kong as well. They have for like the the physical proximity to mainland China. They actually don't really know <laughs> much about mainland China at all. I mean, especially compared to um, say how many. Uh, what the extent to the, the mainland Chinese people would know about, you know, places like Hong Kong or Taiwan, simply maybe because, you know, the, the prevalence of, uh, you know, the media they could access because, you know, as, as we mentioned before, you know, a lot, lot of Chinese mainlanders consume media from Taiwan, from Hong Kong. You can't uh, go and, to mainland China nowadays and not see Taiwanese influence. There, there's nowhere yes. without Taiwanese influence in the mainland. Yes, but then like I, people in Taiwan are like, oh, now like mainland China is uh, like revving up its soft power, and they're going to brainwash us. Like for example, like you know the TV show um, Rap in China, they're like, see, they're doing that because it's it's hip and cool, and they want to brainwash like young Taiwanese people into liking them. And I'm like, well, 
they they were listening to all of like like Zhou Jielun, Cai Lin, Wang Lihong, and all that stuff like in the mainland. Like like when I, when I, when I went to Shanghai in two thousand seven, like I I was here. I heard um Cai Lin's on Mr. Q everywhere I went. Yeah, I mean they have a huge market, and that's one um, you know that 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 which leads to the other controversy, right? When uh when when a a, a Taiwanese uh a singer or or idol getting censored in in mainland because of some some political views, and then um then they say, oh, you know, this is an example of China using its uh market to to um interfere into to to control the, the the freedom of speech in other other uh in you know in democracies right? i do that, think that's often... that such censorship i mean i understand the reasoning for censorship but i do think that sometimes it's done a little bit overboard to the point where it I... gets the gets the reverse result i mean why like like okay i, I understand like if you listen to this episode, you know that I am recognizing that Taiwan, for a v- variety of reasons, is very reactionary in many ways, because you know people in power are very reactionary. But um, that doesn't explain everything about why um, a lot of the people in Taiwan are unfamiliar or even um, uh, resistant, or not resistant, but like um, just 对大陆有点抗拒 Mm-hmm. Sure. Sure. I, I, I think my I think my English is degrading or something. <laughs> but um, they, they're um they're apprehensive about um you know understanding the mainland or or being close to the mainland. Unwilling, I think more. I, I think more. a lot of that, not a lot of that, but part of it has to do with like the heavy-handed um, like um the the way that um China the mainland China tries to um you know get people to accept. Like its position, sometimes it's done in it, its soft power isn't as refined as like the U.S. is. Like the U.S. can yeah. do a lot of fucked up shit, and people still think it's awesome. Yep. Like, yep. whereas mainland China can do like good things, and it'll still be seen as fucked up. Yep. Yep. But part like, of that, uh... part, part of that has, I, I think, um, the the party does have to kind of do some self reflection. Oh, of course. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I. Um, for a long time listener of the show, you know, p- the audience would know I'm 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 uh, I'm all for freedom of speech. You know, I'm I'm totally against censorship, and I, I think one of the oh, some things should be censored. Uh, I don't know. I, <laughs> I I I think I okay okay child pornography. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, but but most other things. Uh, I think should just be left out in the open, and then for people to form their own judgment. And and because you know how how are you? I gonna- think now mainland Chinese people are um are, for the most part, they're supportive enough of their government that like some stupid internet memes not going to like challenge the hegemony exactly. of the party. Exactly. But I but that's not but the problem is you know that's not how people in charge, uh, thinks that you know yeah. like like from from my understanding is that. You know the people who who are in charge of the propaganda department in terms of censorship in mainland China, they're still from like the older generation, and and for them it's kind of. You just need to a, wait for them to retire. No, uh, definitely, I, I <laughs> I'm all for that. But the, the you know the for for a lot of the problem, you know, like they they it's almost a, a instinct to try to control everything. They they want to control the narrative. They 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 are. Kind of uh, scared of, you know. I mean, they, they've to... they've seen what's happened in Eastern Europe with you know, like Prague Spring. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. That the fall of that East Berlin. Yes, or East Germany. Yeah. yeah. So I, I mean, mean it's, it's, I, this is part of like the reeling in from 1989. Yes. Yes. There, there is a lot of that, but I think yes. um, I think the co- context nowadays is so different, and the power balance is so different that. You don't have; they don't have much to worry about. I, I, you and I, we are on the same page on that. But I mean, that's and I want that. I, I want this sort of like censorship to be lifted because I think they are actually getting in the way of mainlanders and Taiwanese people really getting to understand each other. Because like the version, like how come like all of a sudden like now mainlanders now are like um very um are, are very um. Disappointed in their Taiwanese compatriots, 
part of that is because for so many years, they've been like given this image of Taiwan that's not exactly representative of what's going on in Taiwan. Yes. That they don't realize that since like the early 2000s, like less and less people in Taiwan see themselves as, as Chinese. And it's not necessarily because every single one of them is like a Hanjian, like a traitor, or because they are um, lapdogs of U.S. imperialism. I mean, okay, the people in charge are, and they get affected <laughs> by that. But there's there's more to that. But yes. if um, you're not given – I mean, okay – People in the mainland are given the full story, but it's not the one that's like pushed the most. Right. So then now, right. so then all of a sudden, like, you know, last year, like the protests in Hong Kong happened, or like you have this, like, Tsai Ing-wen saying her shit nowadays, and they're all just like, oh, fuck, fuck that. We, we, sh- we should, I mean, I, I understand their sentiments, but all of this could have been prevented with like more um... information, uh, more context. Yes, yes, yes. That's, more more context and more mutual show, right? understanding. Yeah, that, I mean, that's why we have this show and that's why I, I invite you to to be the guest because I think this kind of ignorance, it, yeah. it, it happens across the board. I mean, yeah. it's not just on in the, the whole, West. though, pe- mainlanders are more um, are, are more educated about Taiwan than many um, Taiwanese people are educated about are familiar with the mainland. Oh, yeah. But oh, oh, there's there's sure. still there. There are still gaps. Yes, yes, definitely. Because like I, I'm on, I mean, I'm on, I'm pretty active on Weibo, and like I find myself um like talking about certain. I talk about cross strait relations a lot, mm-hmm. and um I find myself um having to explain certain things to people just because yeah. like I'll say something that I, that I take for granted, and then they're mm-hmm. not familiar, and then I had to kind of explain it. Like they didn't under, they didn't know, for example, like so, some of the people didn't know, for example, how um um the Chiang Kai Shek regime, like like. They understood that okay, Chiang Kai-shek was reactionary and like he was bad to um like people in Taiwan, but they didn't understand the extent of like, for example, banning like local dialects in schools or whatever. Like yeah. the way that Mandarinization was carried out in Taiwan, because they imagine, oh, I guess Mandarinization in Taiwan was carried out the same way it was in the mainland. No, like, it just happened. No, it wasn't. No, no. I mean, but see, like... you know, because of the way it was done in the mainland, no one's like really anti-Mandarin. Whereas, like yeah. in Taiwan, you have like certain segments of the population who are. Yes, I mean that. That's I like to use opportunity to you know like sometimes you see uh, you know Western academics or you know in the Western media they decry about this somehow this what was a Mandarin hegemony in mainland somehow it's uh, you know like uh, it is this evil CCP is trying to um, forge this artificial identity by wiping out the you know the local culture etc it's like what the hell are you talking about I grew up in in China in 1980 you know I I the, you know the, the the way that Mandarin was taught in school it was not it wasn't it would it, it's it doesn't feel like it's been Shuffle down anybody's throat. It's well. That's it's, why you still call Hainan Dao Hainan Dao. <laughs> okay, that's true. That's true. Because, no, but I mean, yeah, I'm not. Like, I'm not saying that to like make fun of you. I mean, it's no, just no, like I kind don't... of. But but what I'm saying is, it's like a good example of like this sort of thing. I mean, um, like my generation in Taiwan, people born after the '90s, like everyone speaks Mandarin. Like, okay, there is that. Like, there, there is a distinct Taiwanese accent, but it's not like um, but it's not like broken Mandarin. Right. Like, um, right. like pre- previous generations, like some of the people speak broken Mandarin, but not like this generation. Whereas like I go to Xiamen, which is just right across the Taiwan Strait, very similar background and like even um, the, the similar dialect. Yeah. But then when they when people my age over there speak Mandarin, you can tell there's a heavier accent, like heavier yeah. local accent than in Taiwan. Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. But it, it's things are different in China now, though. Because like now they're starting Mandarin um, education, like in kindergarten. So so a lot of uh, kids actually come out of the kindergarten speaking Mandarin, and then I was actually surprised by that development because that that was different from how I remember in nineteen eighties. Because uh, you know I will have uh, my cousin's children, uh, right? Like my cousin will speak to their children in their own dialect, whether in Chongqing dialect or Zhejiang dialect. And the children will respond in standard Mandarin. I was like, what? Because <laughs> this is how it reminded me how like it, it is in, in, in US where like a lot of the first generation uh, Chinese parents will speak to their children in Chinese, but the 
the, the, the second generation ABCs would respond in English, right? You know, it's like they, they, they understand it, they understand Chinese, but they're more familiar and more comfortable using English to reply. And well, my parents told me to cut that shit out. <laughs> yeah, my, my sister actually had to enforce a, 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 a Chinese only rule in the house because, you know, they wouldn't have much chance to speak Chinese outside the house. So yeah. speaking of so, this, I think um, I, I think there is a tendency, though, in like, you know, Chongqing, Sichuan, for people to just not speak standard Mandarin, like even why, like, yeah. I, because like, <laughs> because honestly, you don't speak standard Mandarin, people still understand you. It's close enough to standard Mandarin yeah. that you can kind of, you yeah. realize the patterns. Wow. 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 Okay. I think, I think so for us, that's, you know, Sichuan dialect and standard Mandarin is so similar, but for, from people from Beijing, they, they still have trouble understanding us. I think there's a, there's a power difference in, in among the kind of the different, different languages of different dialect, right? Like, oh, like dude, when I was in Shanghai, I understood my, uh, my Chengdu taxi driver perfectly. I think it's because I listened to so much Chengdu hip hop. Exactly. <laughs> he just spoke to me in like Chengdu Hua and I was like, oh, this is awesome. I feel like I'm in like a <laughs> Shuchang Guan rap video. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's, that's one. I mean, another thing is because the, especially coastal China, like places around Shanghai, they also receive a lot of migrant labor from all over China. Yeah, so yeah. it kind of They're makes used to sense. Broken Mandarin. Yeah, so it, it kind of makes sense for standard Mandarin become like the lingua franca uh, in everyday life. But whereas like Sichuan was kind of the 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 source of the labor, you know, it's one of the labor exporting provinces. So we we don't get a lot of outsiders coming in. So so you know, people everybody still speak local dialect. I I think that's probably the easiest explanation. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think what do you think about next time we start talking about um changes like. I think the '90s would be a good place to start, yes. and um, I th I think it would be good to just kind of um tie Li Donghui, Chen Shui Bian, Ma Yingjiu together, yeah. and then we'll see how far we go then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, because um, we, we kind of talk about the background of Taiwan, yeah. or Jiang Jingguo era, with the economic development as well as the development of a political op opposition and, and their ideology, and also their and, class background and how that yes. um, how that yes. affects their views. Yes, because there and, and, is like even if you listen to some like pro ind independence advocates, and I'm like not for for independence, but then you, I I feel that regardless of whether it's in the West or in the East, there is a tendency to just um, dismiss everything they say and not think about why they reach those conclusions or like the background of like their ideas. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. it's important to understand if we want to um. Regardless of whether you are for or against independence, if you want to push your views, you have to understand these things. Yes. See, this is one of the reason I'm against censorship. I, I believe all the views should be aired so they can be, you know, like like all the all you so they can be deconstructed and and be argued against, right? Yeah. You, you can't argue against something if you don't even understand like the people who are putting forth such argument. You you know, you can only like effectively be 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 more effective to to persuade people if you actually understand where the the context of the argument where it's coming from uh, yeah so so we we let's do that next time or well, next time we're talking about you know the development of the of the the pro independence party the 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 uh, the DPP we're going to talk about the evolution of of Taiwan uh, politics after the ending of martial law, because you know the martial law was basically like a state of emergency officially existed in Taiwan after KMT came over uh, until like, like the four death, decades. Death of, yeah, until the death of uh, Jiang Jingguo, basically in the eighties. So, so the um, you know we're going to talk about the transition of Taiwan from you know the martial law to uh, the so-called. So-called, yeah, electoral democracy, and and it's it was a very important era because you know this was also the time where a lot of the decentification campaign got started and happened because like as we mentioned in the nineties, most of the people in Taiwan still identify as Chinese. But nineties was that, interesting because people were still riding the waves of like the um, earlier economic miracle. Yes, 
but but then like they were they, there was this new um political environment so they were super optimistic and also you know the soviet union had fallen and yes. much of the socialist bloc had been like overthrown so yep. i mean in their mind in their in their mind that was that stuff was like dictatorial so then they were like oh this is like the this is like the victory of democracy worldwide and the future is only going to get brighter that's when the francis fukuyama's end of history came about and yeah. you know like everybody like i lived in the 90s i mean it was pretty bleak <laughs> i was like I remember, you know I, I went to college and 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 entered the workforce at the end of 90s and and all i could think of is like what this is the end of history this is pretty <laughs> this is pretty bleak man <laughs> and, no, but the thing then, is like it's I, I think the 90s and like the so-called free world was just like one giant like one giant drug trip Oh yeah, yeah. I and mean, then the like, two thousands was like the come down because um at the same time like you, you're it was like this one big hallucination and it was also at the expense of um newly open markets and exploitation and um the 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 movement of um you know Western capital into for example the Commonwealth of Independent States ex Soviet yeah. states and all that stuff. I mean you watch you watch some movies from um. Russia during that time, they're all like super fucking bleak. Like, have you seen Have you seen Brat? No, I haven't. It's a It's a pretty good Russian movie. It's it okay. takes place in the nineties. It's like, yeah, everything's like super bleak in that movie. It's all uh, super low budget too, but like, yeah. I I the the Russian movie I saw from ninety was uh, about the Russian war in Afghanistan. Oh. Uh, for- name it's it's super good i i, I highly recommend it. but it's pretty bleak too <laughs> it's yeah. pretty bleak. and and uh uh yeah and and in 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 because it was it's it's i think it's obvious with people with their eyes open you know in, in the 90s what the, the so-called end of history is basically the trying tri- triumphant american-led uh capitalism uh getting imposed all over the world and and it was it was like like i can see how people in taiwan would kind of fell for that because you know at at the time that was a that was the environment when gordon chan's uh coming collapse of china <laughs> came about right in 2001 because everybody expected oh you know the the after 1989, you know, Tiananmen start with Tiananmen Square protests and with the collapse of the Soviet Union, China would be soon be next, right? I mean, like there are even people inside China that felt that way. Um, I mean, like the, the, there was even, I mean, I have, I, I'm heavily involved on in Chinese internet. I mean, I haven't even seen people talk about stuff like, you know, why, why Chinese Communist Party still call itself communist, you know, like, why can it rename itself like something, something socialist to, to, to like, so they, they not, you know, be always be targeted, right? Like, like the, it's like the one of the main biggest social uh, country officially called communist, right? And then, and then, uh, you know, even, even people, people questioning that, there's a, I mean, not a, not a, not a small minority voice either. And between, yeah. So um, I think between now and then, what I, what I want to do, what I hope to do is I have a book that's written by Chen Shui-bian. And oh, um, I, I flipped through parts of it. And like a lot of, a lot of what he's saying in that book, cause it was written in the early 2000s is like this sort of optimism. Yes. And it's like, it's, it's a bunch of bullshit to people like who yeah. have their eyes open. But I think it's interesting because um, I, I know he, I, I, he probably doesn't believe the stuff that he was saying. <laughs> but I think it's it's important to understand um, what was being propagated and what people were yes. thinking at the time to really. Um, yeah. So I hope to kind of go through that book a little bit more. Yes. Yes. So we're, we're going to next uh, episode coming up. We're going to talk about the Taiwan in the 90s and the Li Denghui era. Oh, we um, could talk about the um, the 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 kind of the what was it? The third Taiwan Strait crisis. Zhang Zemin and oh, yeah. yes, that was a missile test, right? Yeah, you were you were you you were like kind of older when that happened, so you probably yeah. have some some. Yeah, yeah, I was that. in college. I was yeah. in college. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I at the time um, I still didn't I was... know how to read when that happened. So <laughs> yes, I'm old. So I was uh, I was already in college, and and I read some uh, thing on you know publishing LA Times because I was already in Caltech at the time and. I thought those editorial were ridiculous, and and next episode I'm gonna give my take 
on the you know the, the Western media take of of, of the, the the cross strait relations because I thought it was like it was totally off, man. It's like what, what the hell was these Western so called Western China watcher analysts are talking about? Uh, but but we can't looking get at into- you, Law Y eighty six. Oh God, I he he's actually. I don't know if I'm not sure if he was born back then. Like he, he was, I think he's pretty young. I oh, mean, yeah, compared to me, <laughs> he's a, I think he's like ten, a good ten years younger than you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so he was probably so. If I was in college, he was probably like junior Teenager. high. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, yeah, well, we can talk about all that uh, next because we we are already hitting getting close to two and a half hour mark. So, yeah, so it's a point to stop. Yeah. All right. It was nice being on again, and um, hopefully, I won't put off doing my um, research and stuff like I did last time oh you know no worries i mean we have i think there's already plenty of content for our audience to digest and and you know i have people who patrons specifically subscribe to silk and steel to hear the taiwan history series so so thank you yeah so thank you again for coming to the show um always a pleasure yeah yeah and until next time um bye 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 to subscribe, search in Google the Silk and Steel podcast. The Patreon link should be the second one from the top. Or you can go to patreon.com in the search box, type in Silk. So the Silk and Steel podcast should be the first one in the result. I put in a lot of time and effort to put together this podcast, and I do ask you for your support. For $5 a month, you will receive premium patron-only episodes like this that details culture, politics, history of China, its surrounding region, and China's relationship with the world. You will also receive pre-released regular episodes before they have been released to the general public, as well as newsletters detailing everything China related topics. I hope you enjoy the show and I hope you subscribe. Thank you for listening.